Can you hear me? There we go. You, can you hear me now? Um, yep, five foot four, perfect average height for a woman. That's me. Hi. Um, so uh, I actually got my doctoral degree here, and I'm an alum, and so it's a true honor and a privilege to be with you today. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, I'm the director of the PRISM group, and PRISM is an acronym for Penn Staters Researching Interventions for Social Misconduct. And some of the work I'm going to mention today um, has been uh, supported by the College of Liberal Arts and the Department of Psychology. So let's go ahead and get going. First of all, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I thought that uh, we might begin by talking about sex. Oh, wait, wait, I think maybe, it's, maybe it isn't such a, I mean, there's somebody in the back who's kind of like waving me off. Um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely somebody in the back who, who looks like this. Um, maybe I should have picked it. Well, you know, it, it is reasonable, I guess. I mean, sex is one of those topics you're not supposed to really talk about, right? I mean, religion, politics, sex. I mean, what am I doing? All five foot four inches of me should have known better. Um, but it turns out that however you feel about these topics, they are challenging to talk about, right? So um, one of the most challenging things for many parents is to talk to their emerging teens about sex and having the sex talk. I mean, there's a booming book industry about this to support it. Um, we know that sex ed in academic institutions, educational places, schools, very, very controversial. Um, and even as you kind of move into personal relationships, um, you can find evidence that um, talking about sex can be really challenging for couples. And so talking about sex can be really challenging, and that's not specific to a, a particular situation or a particular context. And so talking about sex is, is challenging. What do you think that means for talking about sexual misconduct? And that's a real issue for us. Now, we do get some help with this, right? So um, the No More folks have a public service announcement out. It involves NFL players, very famous people like Super Bowl winner Eli Manning. Um, I don't know how many people recognize LeVar Arrington, but um, definitely played football here. He's definitely a Penn State alum, and he's been known to say he bleeds blue and white. But if you look at these kinds of public service messages, you see something really interesting. So in this No More campaign involving NFLers, um, the football players come on, they say things like, no more boys will be boys, and no more, what's the big deal? And no more, that's just the way he is. No more, he, he just has a temper, but he has such a bright future, but he's such a nice guy, but it's not my problem. And then they close with like the no more excuses. But these are all after-the-fact statements. These are all reactionary. And the No More people, I think, realize this because they also have another um, public service announcement line where you know the kind of tagline is domestic violence and sexual assault are hard subjects for everybody to talk about. And in one of the public service announcements, in this line, you have um, the cast members of special victims units doing interesting things. So, um, they're blinking back tears, and, and, and they, just, they just can't do it, and so they apologize, or, or they look down at the ground, and, and they, they just can't do it. And then maybe they'll gesture, just, just give me a minute, but, but they can't really figure out the words to say. Um, and then they close in a very unusual, awkward way while having a cast member kind of wait and then kind of smile awkwardly like the, the silence is too much to take. And he says, somebody tell a joke. And, and I guess I get it. I mean, it's awkward. He's trying to break the silence. Um, but the truth is, is that this is no joke, right? Research shows that one in five women will be victims of sexual assault during their college years. All right, so let's go to University Park. Let's look at some data from our fall semester. We had 21, 514 women enrolled at University Park according to our Penn State fact book. And if you do the math, it's no joke. It's very scary. And if the percentages hold, that suggests that over 4,300 women on this campus have been or will become a victim of sexual assault 
while they are enrolled at University Park or while they're enrolled in Penn State. Now, it turns out that um, this is not new news. There have been a number of stories about this. Um, one of the stories that I particularly, well, I wouldn't say like, but one of the stories that resonates with me comes from Onward State. I very much enjoy the billboard that's in this picture because sexual assault should not be part of the college experience. Sexual assault should not be part of the college experience. And then the underline, um, it's time to get educated. It is. It's time for us to, to get educated. This also isn't new news. I mean, the campus community has taken sort of like a patchwork quilt approach to this. Uh, there are a number of organizations that are aware of these issues, sexual misconduct issues, that are trying to do things. We've got the athletes with It's On Us. We've got the Only Do It With Consent shirt teams. We've got the Commission for Women, Center for Women, Student Rock Ethics Institute, Police Public Safety, Fraternity and Sorority Life, goes on and on and on. And the task force has been in the news very, very recently. So there are a lot of good things that are going on to help reduce this percentage on our campus. But how do you talk to people about sexual misconduct? I mean, what are we really talking about? We're talking about how to talk to people. We're talking about how to educate people about sexual misconduct. And this is where um, things get challenging, right? So how do you know what you should say? How do you know how you should say it so that you don't make the people you're talking with uncomfortable? So that you don't make yourself uncomfortable? And what if you feel constrained by your role? So for example, faculty members are subject matter experts. They're following syllabi. They're connected to course content. And so these are very, very challenging issues for us. And so um, the College of Liberal Arts and the Department of Psychology supported the PRISM group. Uh, and in combination with the Rock Ethics Institute, we created a toolkit to work on some of these issues. If you're interested, the toolkit is at rockethics.psu.edu. And if you um, look at the nav bar on the side of the screen, you can scroll down, click on the link. And if you click, you'll see uh, something like this. And the toolkit is full of interesting things. I mean, there's some background information so that student leaders, faculty leaders, um, leaders generally who would like to talk about these things have some pointers to vetted websites, uh, class activities for some active learning components, some mini PowerPoint presentations, uh, and those kinds of things. And so some of the class activities involve resources for students created by students. Some promote self-reflection. Um, the presentation recommendations are based on the experiences that our research team has had talking with people and um, some recommendations that come to us from the Center County Women's Resource Center. And there are also some interesting pointers to pieces of information that people usually don't think about, like male sexual assault, for example. The uh, mini PowerPoint presentations are very, very small so that you can mix and match to support a variety of educational discussions connected to sexual misconduct. And um, the minis that are up there, the mini PowerPoint presentations include a number of different things. Um, the he said, she said one is actually based on data we've collected on this campus about gender differences in the way um, students perceive or misperceive cues for sexual availability. We've got um, information up there about masculinity and femininity in advertising, bystander intervention, consent, coercion, how to talk with survivors, the effects of assault, some things on rape myths, date rape, date rape drugs, and something about local resources. Now, sometimes people will ask, okay, so you've gone through this, you've looked at all of these materials, are there any kind of common themes or take home messages that we could pass on? And the answer is yes, yes there are. Um, and these are themes that have already come out at State of State already. First of all, um, things that can be helpful, offer assistance. People might turn you down, but take the initiative to offer. Uh, show respect with respect to sexual misconduct, it's all about consent, consent, consent. Get the clear and voluntary yes before you undress. Uh, and remember to lead by example. Be accountable for your actions. 
And when we do these things, when we offer assistance, we show respect, and we lead by example, we will strengthen our efforts in the battle against sexual misconduct. And when we choose to do these things as a community and truly commit as a community, then I think the message speaks for itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>